Thank you. Wow, it's great to be here. So before I start, I'd like to say thank you to all of you on behalf of the Go team for what you have made with Go. And we wouldn't be here. Go wouldn't be where it is now. It could be the greatest language in the world without you, the developers. So a big round of applause to all the Govers in the world. Thank you very much. So my talk is about the software development process. However, any professional software setting has some design process in place. And the goal is usually the same. You want to make sure that your design is sound and solid before the implementation starts. And the reason is simple as well. Uh, any mistake that you can uh, catch early are much cheaper than the ones that you catch later. The processes uh, and approaches are usually quite similar too, at least when you look at them uh, from a 30,000 foot perspective. There's usually some form of design document, uh, a specification of the software that you want to build, so to speak. And there is um, a review process uh, with feedback from experts and design reviewers. And there's also some form of iteration of this process. Often, However, this design process is somewhat of a dry exercise. There is not much code being written during this process. After all, we are all professionals now. We're not hackers anymore, at least some of us. Uh, and we don't write code without having thought about it first. Uh, and the bigger the project, the more there is to think about, or isn't it? But no matter the approach, a crucial question always remains. How can we tell that our design is any good? Anywhere else outside uh, of the software industry, designing and prototyping are actually very closely intertwined. There's virtually no design of anything, clothes, furniture, appliances, cars, even architecture, uh, even art, that is not prototyped before going into production. This graphic taken from the design school of Stanford University, illustrates this design process in five steps. After learning and defining a problem, at Google we call this focus on the user and all else will follow. Designing is really a repeated sequence of idea creation, uh, prototyping and testing. A designer does not think his way to a good design. She builds her way to the good design. In other words, designers are really doers. We might even call them hackers. So let's shift gears a little bit and look at a specific example of language design. <clears throat> and specifically in this case, designing language support for Go for numerical applications. As some of you may know, there's actually a concrete proposal submitted, uh, and it's been out there for many years, actually. And it's asking for multidimensional slice support in Go, or some form of you know, support for matrices, things like that. Concretely, multidimensional slices permit the declaration of, say, something like a two-dimensional slice, for instance, a matrix. And uh, with make, ideally, it would be possible to create such a two-dimensional slice that's uh, dynamically sized at runtime, and there is even indexed access to its elements via two-dimensional indices. This is currently not possible in Go. Um, while we do have arrays and slices, and while arrays do allow the definition of two-dimensional data structures that are laid out contiguously in memory, they are also statically fixed in size. And slices are dynamically sized, but they're inherently one-dimensional. So the high-level goals of this proposal are simple enough. Improved readability through nice notation, such as this multi-dimensional indexing, and ideally, good performance due to a native implementation. But there are still many open questions. And the existing design document answers those questions, but again, how do we know they are the right answers? However, we can make some high-level observations. It turned out that we can implement many aspects of this proposal in Go already. For instance, we can define slice descriptors for 2D, three-dimensional, four-dimensional slices or matrices. It's just an abstract data type, after all. Furthermore, 
we can define and implement operations on those data types, which is to say, define methods on them. That is, it's already possible to write numerical code and play with that design. That's actually what the GoNum community has been doing for quite a while. Unfortunately, there is a key missing feature. The nice notation is not there. For instance, there's simply no way, in existing Go at least, to write a two-dimensional index expression. And the current workaround that exists is based on accessor methods, such as at and at set, uh, to set an element of a matrix, for instance. But accessors like these, they make numerical code look clunky, perhaps even unreadable. So how can we get around this notation problem? There are a few solutions. We can say it's not a problem, and some people might be okay with that, uh, but it's probably not a good uh, answer in the long run. We could go and actually change the Go implementation, uh, but that's a very costly way just to see if our design is okay. Or, and that's a third, uh, much more viable option, we could actually rewrite the code. Whenever we see what we would like to write, a indexed by i, comma j, we rewrite it into a method call a at i of i, comma j. And we can do this by hand. Uh, that's going to get old pretty quickly. Or we can do it automatically, like with a rewriter. So if we had such a rewriter, which would really be the prototype of our implementation, uh, then we could actually explore the design space before making any hard decisions and actually really go and change the compiler. So let's design that rewriter, which is going to be this prototype. So since we want to rewrite our index expressions into methods, we are going to allow two special new method names made up of a sequence of index and assignment operators. And I'm calling them here indexed uh, getter and indexed setters. Uh, just for good measure, I'm adding the plus operator here as well. It's not really important for uh, this specific prototype, but it's going to make it much easier to explain the process in which the rewriting happens. So this is just a, a little helper here. In fact, I used the plus operator to prototype my prototype because it was easier to do. So we're also going to uh, allow more than one index in an index expression because that's what we really want to do. And finally, we need to give those new um, index expressions some meaning. And the idea is simple. Whenever we see an index expression where the uh, left-hand operand, x in our case, is of a type that implements one of these methods, then the index expression is really interpreted as meaning that we're going to call this method instead. And this last part is crucial. It's really the core of our rewriter. And we're going to look at this in more detail now. Now that we know what our rewriter is supposed to do, we need to come up with a suitable implementation. And remember the goal, since our existing Go doesn't understand our extended language, we are going to rewrite our extended programs into programs that are understood by current Go. And it turns out that is pretty straightforward. First of all, we're going to rewrite our new method names into valid Go identifiers. It doesn't really matter what they are. I've chosen some names that uh, make sense, so you can understand your code for debugging, uh, and also so that there's hopefully no conflicts with other uh, commonly used identifiers. Similarly, we're going to rewrite the index expressions into method calls as shown. Uh, luckily, the, the Go standard library provides all the tools uh, to do this. We have a parser to read the source. The parser is going to produce a syntax tree, and it's that tree that we're going to go to modify. After that, we can just use the Go printer library to generate the new source from this modified tree. Since we want to accept different kind of method names than are currently possible, and we want to have more than one index in index expressions, we actually have to change the parser. And if we want to have it printed out nicely, we also need to change the printer. But it turns out those changes are rather simple and small. It's maybe 20, 20 to 30 lines of code. These are really the only changes that we need to make in the uh, existing libraries. 
So let's consider this simple example. It's based on rewriting the plus operator, so we can concentrate on the essential, but everything I'm saying here also applies to uh, index operators in, uh, in general. So on the left-hand side, um, we see the code that we would write, like to write in our extended language. There's a plus method defined for our data type, point, and we can now use a binary operation to add two points with the effect that the plus method is called, or after rewriting, really, the add method. And on the right-hand side, we, show the, we see the rewritten source. This is now regular Go code that will compile and run, while the left-hand side doesn't. Because we need to understand the structure of the source that we're going to rewrite, we're going to, and, and because the syntax tree reflects that structure exactly, this is what we're going to do. We're going to rewrite the syntax tree and not the source. And again, for simplicity, I'm looking here at addition. And it turns out that the rewriting of the method name is trivial. It's actually so simple that we could do it while we parse. It's just the, uh, the change of the value of the, the name string for that method. Uh, we're not going to do it during parsing, because if we do it there, then we don't get the nice uh, pretty printing with GoFault. The rewrite of the binary expression is a little bit more tricky, because we cannot just simply rewrite any binary expression. Uh, we can only do it if the left operand, uh, the type of the left operand implements the plus method, or after rewriting the add underbar underbar method. Luckily, again, the standard library helps us out. We have a Go type checker, and we can simply invoke it, uh, Go types in our case, on the syntax tree, and compute all the types for all of our operands. After that, in a second step, we can look at all the binary operations uh, or indexing operations and uh, see where the left operand has the right type that implements an add or an indexing operation and then rewrite those. So let's see this in action. So here we have a, a syntax tree for x plus y plus uh, z after parsing. There's no types at this point. Now we're going to run the type checker. And as expected, it determines the types for all the operands x, y, and c. But we also have a couple of types missing. And this is, of course, because the type checker is still uh, the type checker for the existing Go language, it doesn't know about plus for x and, uh, and y. So now we could go ahead and change the type checker, but we really don't want to do this. It's uh, probably the uh, single biggest uh, and most complicated library in the standard library. It's a complex beast. We really don't want to touch it. Instead, we just make an assumption. This is a prototype. We want to keep it cheap and simple. So the assumption that we're going to make is that these errors are due to the fact that these pluses should have been rewritten. So let's just rewrite where we can. In our example, we will end up with a method call instead of the first edition and the, and the new modified syntax tree that we see on the right-hand side. Now we're turning the crank again for a second round of type checking. And at this point, we have more success and only one type is missing. Again, we assume that the missing type is due to the fact that we didn't rewrite uh, the binary addition. So let's determine again what there is to rewrite, and then rewrite once more. This leaves us with a final tree um, that, is, that has all the additions replaced with uh, method calls. So now how do we know we're done? Well, we type check one more. And this time there's no errors anymore. So we do have a valid Go program at this point, and it will compile. It may not run, but it will compile. Uh, and so we're, in fact, done. So this is really the implementation, the core of the implementation of our prototype. Now that we have this concrete uh, implementation at our disposal, we, we can actually play with it. We can judge our design, and we can see how it feels. And if we don't like it, we can make changes and refine our design that way. So this is really how we build our way towards the correct or, or the good solution. So for instance, using this rewriter, we can now define a matrix type, effectively representing a two-dimensional slice together with nice indexing accessors. 
And uh, this matrix type, uh, this, this structure resembles closely actually a slice descriptor, except that instead of just having an underlying array and the length and maybe a capacity, we have now two lengths for uh, the length in each dimension and two strides, which is the steps between the elements in each dimension. And given this matrix type, we can now implement matrix multiplication using nice notation. Uh, I'm just showing the core of the multiplication here. On the left, we have the code that we would like to write and which current Go doesn't understand. And on the right, we have the rewritten version, which is valid Go source code. Finally, I want to briefly raise one important point which I haven't touched at all so far. During the implementation of the prototype, one will invariably encounter the unexpected. Or in other words, questions will come up that we didn't even know we should be asking before starting the, the prototype or, in fact, the design. And without a prototype, these same questions, they will actually show up when you do the real implementation, and then it's maybe too late or too costly. In our example, there was one surprise, and that was at least a surprise to me, I found that these index operators were so effective and, in fact, so cheap to implement, syntactic sugar, really, in addressing this specific problem that I was wondering, is it really maybe all that we need? That's a, that's a big if. I don't know. Uh, there needs to be a little bit more time to play with this, and there's a lot of stuff to think about here. I'd like to conclude with a couple of observations. So first of all, it turns out Go is actually a fantastic programming language for prototyping. And I think that's pretty uh, obvious to everybody. This is really why a lot of people say Go has brought back the fun to programming. Secondly, prototyping is really the way to, go, to get to good design. Instead of thinking about it, we can build towards the good design. And finally, if we can prototype even language changes, we can prototype pretty much everything. But Frederick Brooks said it probably best uh, in his 1975 classic, plan to throw one away, hopefully your prototype, because you will throw one away anyhow. Thank you very much. <laughs>